recording? I can tell. Okay. All right, so my hope today is we don't blow up the projector. <coughs> All right, so we can infinite regression. All right, so let's uh, talk a little bit about more about vision. And so, you know, kind of what we did near the end of the class is I talked a little bit about how we adapt to light at different levels. And I intended to bring my cheat sheet with me, and I didn't bring that. So I want to go over it again just to make sure I didn't screw anything up. Because I kind of go over that with this fine memory. I think it did OK, but you never know. And it is actually an important concept because the kind of um, stuff we're talking about uh, when we talk about how rods and cones are adjusting to light actually applies to a whole bunch of sen sensory mechanisms. And so the key there is the calcium. If you look at other sensory systems, they also bring in calcium at the same time that you polarize. And when you see that in a cell, that typically means it's going to be part of sen sensitization, right? It changes to different amplitudes of stimulus. So for the rods and the cones, we talked about the fact that they're very active in the dark and less active in the light. In fact, they get down to the point where there's no activity. And so if we do a chart where we talk about light intensity in this axis, and really what we're looking at, remember when we talk about light intensity, is over a certain range. So we're in this room, there's an area that's in shadow, there's an area that looks dark, there's an area that looks light, there's an area that looks very light. Those same values would be totally different if we were outside, as far as the actual illumination. So it's kind of relative light intensity across the spectrum. And then on this level, we sort of have activity of the neuron. We can measure that in different ways. It could be neurotransmitter release, right, which would be high up there at the top, low down at the bottom. It could be the depolarization state, right, we're more depolarized at the top less depolarized at the bottom. And so what we would see over this intensity is a curve. It looks kind of like this. Now you'll notice that part of the problem here is that there's a nice little fat section at the middle of the curve where any change in light intensity leads to a pretty big change in activity. And that's really what we want if we're trying to get information about the outside world. We're going to have a lot of response changes to you know, relatively minor changes in the stimulus. Once we get out here, the cell is essentially not doing anything, and it's no matter how much more light we're going to have, it's not going to be any more silent. Once we get up here, we maximally we max the cell out the other way. In other words, it's releasing as much neurotransmitters as it can. It's depolarized to the biggest extent. It gets darker, there's no more information to be had. So the problem, of course, is if we go into an area that's even darker illumination, if we just stick with this, this eventually we can't see anything. If we go to an area that's a lot lighter, again, everything's top down. So what we need to do is we need to have this curve shift. And often the way you're going to see this depicted is over a lot of different intensities, you would see multiple curves. Because right? you shift this curve one way or to the other to deal with different intensities. So let's talk a little bit about sort of how we do that. So just to remind us if we're in the dark, right, we're talking about the fact that not only are we releasing a lot of neurotransmitter, there's a lot of calcium present, right, because that's part of the dark current, the calcium coming in. If we're out here in the light, there's essentially no calcium coming in because we've abolished the dark current. What do we need to keep the dark current flowing? What opens the channel that carries the dark current? Huh? The G protein is going to be part of, well, it's actually part of the light response. The dark current that's letting calcium and sodium in depends on what? What opens it? Huh? Uh, not glutamate. That's the neurotransmitter that's going to be released. CGMP, right? 
So CGMP levels here are high, and the, sort of the, the twin of GBMP, the GMP is once we convert CGMP, it's GMP. So those levels are going to be low, right? So it's going to make us pay more for this research, okay? If we go over here, um, GMP levels are high because we've chomped up all the CGMP, so CGMP levels are low, okay? So what we really want to do when we're talking about this sensitivity is we want to really change the sensitivity of some of this stuff. So for example, uh, in, a, in order for us to make any change, it changes in this direction, right? We need to make it so that over here, we're going to be more sensitive to light. Right? And so in other words, you know, it thinks it's in the dark, but actually we're going to make it so it's a little more sensitive to light. So we're kind of moving down the curve in that direction toward that nice fat metal there, that nice slopey metal. In the other direction, we want it to be less sensitive to light. So it takes more light to actually get over here. So to detect change needs to be less sensitive to light. And if we do that, we're pushing back again towards this nice middle. So anytime we're going to the extremes, we're actually going to push the cell so it gets back to this nice little zone where any sort of change leads to a very large change in activity. And so we said there's several ways to do that and I did post that little um, reading that you could do for this. The ones that we focus, focus in on is that um, we have an increase in CGMP um, slash um, channel affinity. So we're making, um, no, sorry, I got that wrong, decrease, right? So the CGMP that we're making is even less effective than it should be. We have a decrease in guanyl cyclase, or CS, or GC activity. And what does guanyl cyclase do? Makes more CGMP. So we're, we're getting rid of CGMP, in other words. Like there's a natural breakdown of CGMP. We're making less of it. So again, we're pushing us more towards this GMP level. And the opsins become more active. So again, they're activated more easily, so we're pushing us towards a light response. And all that's because the calcium is, for example, changing this affinity, lowering it. It's actually inhibiting the cyclic GMP. There's a process that's calcium dependent that stops opsins from becoming active, right? Um, or I should say this calcium dependent that allows um, opsins to become more active. So all that calcium is, is involved in those processes. We come over here, we're gonna do the opposite. We're gonna try to make this cell less sensitive to light. So we're gonna make whatever CGMP is there more able to interact with the channels. So there's a de uh, an increase in CGMP slash cyclic nucleotide gated channel affinity. So the CGMP that is around is actually more effective. We're gonna increase the activity of uh, guanyl cyclase. So we're making more CGMP. And again, that's because typically we're suppressing that activity with calcium. Without the calcium, we have more of it. And then finally, the opsins are less active. So all that makes it so we're more towards the dark condition. And again, we're trying to get to that nice little middle of the road here. So um, again, there are similar processes to this, to this in things like odor receptor, the, the, the cells that detect odorants, the cells that detect different tastants, the things we taste, the cells that are involved in hearing. If you look at all of those, they're all loading some calcium in when they're active and that is doing something similar there in those cells. They're also able to 
change their sensitivity over large ranges. Um, and I think the thing, same thing is probably true for, for, for sensation as well, because a lot of those piezo channels that we talked about that are part of the sense of touch, they also let calcium in. So I mean, there's a good chance the same thing is happening in those cells as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the rods and the cones. Some of this will be a little bit of review for you, and some of it's going to be um, uh, new, but really, um, we're going to kind of go over just a few differences between rods and cones, and then we're going to dig a little bit deeper and ask about how these cells are going to be uh, interacting with retinal ganglion cells. Um, and so I'm going to, you know, we're going to focus in on a few aspects, mostly color information as we go. So rods and cones do different things. So for example, we can think about how they have effects on acuity, detection of color, sensitivity to light, and by here we mean kind of what light levels are involved, and detection of movement. So roughly, we can divide this in two. When we think about acuity and color, those involve mostly for cones. We think about sensitivity to light, right? We're thinking about, and movement, we're thinking, thinking about the rods. All right, so acuity really just means ability to see fine detail. So because the rods, or I should say before, the, because the cones are much smaller, and they're actually more densely packed, we're able to see finer detail with the cones than we are with the rods. And just as a review, we have a very, very high density of cones at a place called the fovea. And so as you're interacting with the world, um, you're constantly moving your eye around so that you can bring your fovea onto different things to keep get really high detail information about particular area of the visual field. That area of the visual field is actually pretty small. Um, it's really about the size of a quarter, called an arm's length. And so, you know, as you're looking at things, we're not aware of it. We're constantly looking with the, looking with our eye to hit the phobia at different places, and you're getting snapshots of detail. And in your brain, the visual system is basically just assuming, okay, here's the detail at this point. You have an impression that everything is in high detail because your brain is kind of just remembering what it saw over there a little bit earlier, right? So it's kind of interesting stuff here. Color, of course, we talked about the fact that we have three different types, right? Uh, long, short, and medium, or red, green, and blue, right? We have three different types of cones. And so we're gonna be able to take information about color and put that together in complex ways to give us the sensation of literally seeing different shades of color. So those all involve the cones, and we're going to focus mostly on them um, because, you know, as humans, we're kind of really interested in color because it's something we do that a lot of animals don't. So probably this system has been studied more than some of the other ones. When we talk about rods, they have one feature that's really important to us, and that is that they are very sensitive to light, meaning that um, your ability to see things under low light is dependent on the rod, not the cones. Because it takes more energy to activate the cones than it does the rods. If we think about why that's occurring, well, think about how many stacked layers of floating membranes we would have in a rod rather than a cone. Like literally several thousand in a rod, maybe like two or three hundred in a cone based on their size. And so it's a lot more likely that you're going to hit an option in a rod than you are in a cone. You may recall that I said that we can detect a single photon of light, right? Well, the cells that are doing that are the rods. It takes considerably more photons to activate a cone. So what that means is if you're running around at, at uh, any time between dusk and dawn, you are using your rods, right? And uh, your ability to detect color goes down a lot as you go into the night. So, you know, if you've ever tried to tell the difference between a blue and a red car when it's dark out, 
they all basically look the same color because of that, because you don't really have, you're not engaging the rock. Now there's a whole uh, interesting thing that goes with this, and that is if we look in the eye, and I'll probably end up, we'll see a picture of this a little bit later, you notice we have a lot of cells like the horizontal cells and the androgen cells that we're not really talking about, because they get really complicated. Those cells are actually gonna help us in what we call sort of a circuit switching. And that is that the pathway for processing visual information changes from the day to the night. So we start using the endocrine and horizontal cells in slightly different ways in the night than we do in the day to help us see better at night. Likewise, the other thing that's really important about the rod that depends a lot on circuits is motion detection. So if we look at the rods, we notice that they're high, high density at the periphery of our vision. And they're very good at detecting any sort of subtle movement. So, you know, always like telling my students, if you see something move in the corner of your eye, you don't really have any idea what it is because you don't have good acuity and you don't have color vision, but your rods can see very fine movement out there. And the reason they're able to do that is because the way they're hooked up. Right, so if we have, for example, we'll see this a little bit on Friday. We can have a whole bunch of rods that are hooked up, essentially in a circuit, that if I have something that moves in this direction, it would activate this cell, then this cell, then this cell, right, in a pattern. That causes another cell, a retinal ganglion cell, to fire. If I go in the other direction, it doesn't care. Right, so they're hooked up in ways that enable them to detect motion in, several, in different angles. And we'll, we'll talk about that when we see some of the uh, simple cells that we find that work that. So those are the basics of the rod system. Uh, before I get too far, I guess I should mention the test. Right? Um, we're gonna, I'm going to be handing the test out online on Wednesday, so you guys don't have to show up. So it's going to be take home, and it'll be due next. Um, and again, it's going to end with somatosensory stuff. So here is a picture of that circuit we've been talking about. All right, and this is really, again, the back of the eye. We talked about the retinal and pigment epithelium is really important in that vis uh, the visual cycle that we talked about for recycling retinal. Here's our rod and cones, right? The horizontal and ambergris cells that I mentioned, they do, they're doing a lot of complex things, but one of the things they do, again, is this idea we switch circuits during the day and night. But ultimately, we've talked about the fact that the rod and cone are connected to bipolar neurons. And you may remember that we have both on and off bipolar neurons. The off bipolar neurons are firing in the dark, and the on bipolar neurons are firing in the light. And we talked about they're both receiving glutamate, but they're interpreting that differently. And then those cells are going to connect to retinal ganglion cells. And the retinal ganglion cells have axons that leave the eye, so the optic disc, right, are gonna form the optic nerve and then travel back to the thalamus and a few other areas that we'll talk about here in the lecture. So the retinal ganglion cells are the output of the eye. And by the time we get to retinal ganglion cells, there's already been quite a bit of processing that's been done. And in fact, we've segregated information in several different streams, even by the time we get to the retinal ganglion cells. So here's a little bit of uh, the idea of why we know that's happening, right? Anatomically, if we were to look at retinal ganglion cells, we see there's a lot of different types, right? So this is from the mouse retinal ganglion cell. This is actually a little bit old, it's from 2009. Um, there's actually been, at this point, 30 different retinal ganglion cells that have been identified in mice and they have different morphology. We know that they're receiving information in different ways, and we have some idea for a fair number of these what kind of information they're carrying and how they're reacting. Uh, in humans, as far as we know, the, the, the most up-to-date information I could find was 18, right? and that actually was with a primate. So rhesus monkeys slash humans have maybe 18 different retinal ganglion cells that we know about. Again, the experiments in primates are tougher to do, so there may be more. Um, but when we're talking about the visual field, it's also important that um, 
before is not necessarily better and we can have more complicated connections. So in other words, if we find, let's say that D18, just based on morphology, it is possible there's several subtypes there, right? So in other words, we could have a human retinal ganglion cell, we have 18 types, we don't know maybe actually, if we were to look a little bit closer at genes, it would actually be more than the morphology we suggest, right? But the important part here is a lot of these different retinal ganglion cells are carrying slightly different forms of So we'll see that, you know, we talk about the fact that there's some of them that express melanopsin, right? Which is this thing that just tells us whether it's stay or not. But that stream of information really only goes to by itself, where it helps us set our circadian rhythm. It doesn't really do anything else. But for most of the visual system, that's not important. So we're gonna talk about some of these different streams. And again, most of this is gonna focus on color because that's kind of what we understand the most and it's something that's kind of interesting to us. Uh, but we'll see the, some other stuff as well. And so we're gonna follow some of these streams back as we go. And so we're gonna start off with some stuff that actually does involve rods and cones a little bit. So there's some mixture. So you know we do have some retinal ganglion cells that are getting information from only one cone, for example. But we also have retinal ganglion cells that get information from both rods and cones. And see that in shadow there. And what they're trying to show us is there's both an on and an off pathway in this particular thing here. So I want to pop back over here. And then we'll, I am recording this as well. So first one I want to talk about is the diffuse pathway. And as the name implies, a diffuse pathway gets information from many different neurons. So this is going to have a fairly large visual field. Right? It's getting information from a large area. Um, some of these are going to get information about movement. So in other words, we're going to be more or less likely to fire if we go across this field in a particular direction. And um, we have sort of two different pathways here, one of which is getting information from on diffuse bipolars. One is getting information from off. Diffuse bipolars. So if we go over and look at this image, for example, we'll see that here's the on version. And you can see that um, we're at light, light, light. We go to the dark, we turn on the light, it starts to fire, okay? You'll notice that it is transient, so that's kind of interesting. It's not just staying on fire. Here's another one that's part of that off pathway, ultimately. So again, light, light, nothing happens. We go dark, it fires, right? We turn it back on light, it stops firing. Okay, so that's what we mean by the on and off diffuse bipolars. This cell would be active um, in the light. This cell would be active in the dark. Should probably, yeah, that's how we, okay. I wanna make sure it has kind of the same orientation as the slide there. And so that is going to interact, right, at least near a transmitter. Again, we're doing this in a graded manner. We haven't fired an action potential yet. Onto what we're gonna call on retinal ganglion cells. And we're also sending information to some off retinal ganglion cells. And in particular, the particular cells that we are going to be pinning information onto are called parasol retinal ganglion cells. So we have on and off parasol retinal ganglion cells. Does anybody know why we call it a parasol? Does anybody know what a par parasol is? It's a little umbrella. So if you look at it, it has this really broad um, dendritic arbor. So it's getting information from a large area. They're also called magnotype retinal ganglion cells. So we also call them M-type for magno, meaning large. Right, and so we have M-type on and M-type off. 
So the recording that we actually see on this image is from the retinal ganglion cells. We would see a similar depolarization or repolarization. Or see, we'd see um, a repolarization, I should say, a um, depolarization to light in this on bipolar cell, a depolarization to darkness in this bipolar cell. Okay? So we actually see the action potentials there. So that's one pathway. And again, it's giving us information about fairly large receptor fields, both on and off versions. Another well-studied type of retinal ganglion cell is one that is getting cones from on and off midget bipolars, which is probably not the best term. Um, and the reason we call these midget bipolars because they're actually quite small. And so you can see them up here, the blue and the uh, and blue and orange, you have those midget cells. Um, so they're midget bipolars and there's an on version of the midget bipolar and an off version of the midget bipolar. If we look at the dendritic field of the retinal ganglion cells, they're really small. So they're getting information, again, really the idea here is they're getting information really from like one cell. So this is a midget on. This is a midget off. Retinal ganglion cell, okay? Um, these type of cells are typically the ones that are carrying a lot of information about specific colors, right? So the reaction of specific cones or specific rods. So we know, you know, one cone here is turning on, it's giving us information of blue, about blue light or red light, right? It's going to one of these midget on or off uh, retinal ganglion cells. These are also called P-type retinal ganglion cells. And here, P-type stands for parvo, right, which is small or poor. So they're small in size, and again, they have a very small dendritic arc to them. So that's just to give us a little bit of flavor of what's going on here. So, so, far, so far, we haven't talked a lot about exactly what type of information is coming back, right? We've talked about stuff that's diffuse, right? And we're gonna see some, some uh, recordings from cells like that in a second. We've talked about stuff that is, um, you know, involves like single cells, but we're gonna see that, you know, there's gonna be different types of information here. Like we have information about red, about green, about blue and so forth, right? All right, so let's jump back and talk a little bit about the ones that have fairly large receptor fields. And so this is a little cartoon that shows us some of the um, a large receptor fields where that one bipolar cell and ultimately one retinal ganglion cell is actually receiving information from many, many different photoreceptors. And what you see here are sort of three areas, right? We see a dark blue in the center, a reddish area, and then we see sort of a lighter blue on the outside. The receptive field is actually the red with the blue in the center. And what we mean by that is that if I place light somewhere in that particular area, the cell is gonna respond. If I go out a lot beyond that, I'm outside of the receptive field. The other thing we will notice about this receptive field is that there's a center and there's a surround, right? And so often, and we'll uh, come back to this in a second, uh, if we have our receptive field, right, and we'll talk a little bit about responses in that field, um, we could have a center, and then there's a circle. So we have a center, and then there's a surround around that that will also respond. And we're going to see that we could talk about responses being positive, right? In other words, the cell would fire more or negative. Right? But again, here's the center. There's certain cells that would be activated in the center. Other parts, parts would be activated as a surround. Now, the data that we're gonna talk about, um, and I'm gonna show you a little bit of and talk a little bit about, was first discovered in the uh, late 1960s by these two uh, scientists, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel. Um, and they were really some of the first people to really look 
at the response and firing patterns of retinal ganglion cells and also cells in the thalamus and in the cortex of living animals. Um, they won the Nobel Prize in the late 70s for this work. Uh, Torsten Wiesel is actually still alive, he's 97. Um, so, um, you know, he's, there's still a few, you know, few people from this era that are still left over. Um, and what they were doing is they were going to be looking at finding receptive fields from cats, right? A lot of visual field studies are done, or a lot of early visual experiments were done in cats. And I'll go a little bit over how this is done, and then I'll show you a little bit of the data from this. So first of all, most people don't do these experiments by recording from, directly from retinal ganglion cells. Right, you can actually do this in a dish, but most of the experiments we're going to talk about are going to be done in, by recording from the thalamus, sometimes the cortex, and by the time we get to the cortex, there's already some processing done. So in other words, we know that the retinal ganglion cells are firing, they're sending information to the cortex, I should say to the thalamus, excuse me, and there we're really going to record from the cell, and it's really just kind of passing on information, or at least that, or at least that was the first early idea. We know there's a little more complexity there, but at first pass, we can just think of that, those cells in the thalamus as passing on information. So if we record from the thalamus, we get a good idea of what's going on in the retinal ganglion cells. Um, and then you know, we might we'll have to do some experiments and go back and see exactly what type of cell this is coming from. But again, the early experiments were really just done by recording from the thalamus or recording from the cortex. And the way you're going to do these experiments is you're going to take a cat, right, and you're going to intubate it. So you're basically putting down a breathing tube and you're going to have it unconscious. So you have to hold the eyelids open and actually put artificial tears there. The cat's unconscious for all this. And you prepare the animal by placing electrode into the brain. And that's kind of what we saw actually in that previous picture that little head thing that he has on um, is going to have like some little, uh, we drill through the skull, we place a little metal tube there and we now have a very fine wire that we're passing through that tube into the brain. It's driven by a screw so we can make minute adjustments to push that, that little electrode a little deeper into the brain for different recordings. Absolutely not painful to the animal once the surgery's done. Um, I used to do something like this with rats, and you kind of pick up the rats and hold them, and the major thing was they didn't like to be held, and so they got used to you. And you just turn a little screw, and that little electrode's going a little bit deeper into the brain. So, you know, once the animal is prepared, it's really not a problem. The animal's going to be unconscious. You do this experiment, and you can have the animal recover. You can do the same experiment in a day or two, right? Um, the only thing you really have to worry about is the animal might not like the anesthesia. Now, Hubel and Weasel were trying these experiments, and they were trying to get some sort of response from neurons in the thalamus, and then they knew that was, you know, be reflective of responses from retinal ganglion cells. And they had a really, really, really hard time at finding anything that would have caused these animals to respond. Until so one day, they put in this slide, and this was the old days when you had like a projector, and you literally had glass slides, and you're putting them in and shining light through it. They put this slide and all of a sudden the animal cells fired. And I'll show you, you'll hear what that sounds like in just a second. And then, um, of course, they couldn't figure out what was going on. Like why they, they looked at the slide, they couldn't figure out why this animal was fired. They pulled out the slide, well, the animal the cell fired again. Right? Put it back in, the cell fired. What they found is there was a little crack in that slide that was letting a little bit of light through. And it was actually responding to that movement of that line across the visual field. And then so once they did that, they realized some of the types of stimuli that would set off these neurons. They knew they were kind of in the right area, and they started playing around with some different um, types of stimulus. And so one of the types of stimulus that they found that was really important on the level of the retinal ganglion cell, and I'll show you a little movie for this, right, is, um, if I can find it, right, So they're looking at an on-center LGN neuron. So the LGN is in the thalamus, but again, this would be reflective of what's going on also in the retinal ganglion cells. And we'll take a look at this, hopefully. Let's see, we're not getting any sound. So let me restart this. So again, this is 
what the animal is seeing on the field. Um, and they're going to try to find an area where the cell respawns. Okay. And uh, they're getting a signal, so of course they're recording it on an oscilloscope. At the same time, they're running it through some speakers. And for most people, they can actually hear finer stuff than they can see on these kind of things. It's a little bit easier to see what's going on, but here you really have to start tying together a lot of stuff that's going on with the images um, and the sound. So let me kind of show you in more visual form what's going on. So the first thing we have to know, and we'll see this um, played out, is that what they discovered is something called surround inhibition. Okay, And the idea of surround inhibition is that we actually have a pretty big receptive field. The receptive field, if we think about what we really mean, is we typically have a cell that's firing at a certain rate, dip, 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 and it's doing that all the time. We're going to change that rate. The only thing that we're going to be able to change that rate is something that is light within the receptive field. And so if we sort of look at that, if we have something that's an on center, right, and I'll show you this in just a second, and we'll come back to that and we'll dive a bit, right? we would see that the firing rate would go up as we start to shine light in the center. Again, we still know the baseline firing. We would see that the firing rate would actually go down if we start to shine any light in the surround. Right? And then if we get beyond that, it doesn't matter at all. There's no effect. Right? So we have baseline. It goes up in the center, so we call this the on center, right? And it's the surrounding area is going to be inhibitory, right? We could shine light in the um, sur uh, surround. So that's an on center. We also could talk about an off center, right? Which means, again, um, the same thing is going to happen, but rather than having light in the center being excitatory, we're going to have stuff in the uh, that's excitatory is going to be dark. Now, in other words, as long as we have darkness in the center, the cell is going to be excited. Once we start having light, it's inhibited. Now, if we look at this, um, this is also called the Mexican hat model, which is why I had that little chihuahua with the Mexican hat, because it looks like a sombrero, right, where it has the peak in the center, and then shallow areas where we have inhibition, and then again, beyond the hat, there's nothing. Right, so if we look at that in graphical form, here's an example of an on-center cell. So if we're total blackness, we're neither exciting nor inhibiting the cell, so we kind of have a normal firing rate. You'll see then we can put light in the center and you'll see the firing rate goes up. If I have light in the surround, firing rate basically goes away because I'm having all that inhibition. If I have this disk of light, I'm both exciting and inhibiting, right? You see you kind of get back to a normal level of firing. 
So what that's allowing this particular cell to do is really look for particular points of light. Right? It really responds well to points of light. And you might, you might expect this particular retinal ganglion cell gets a lot of information from some of the on bipolars that we talked about, right? And then it's also getting information that's inhibitory from some other on bipolars that are out here in the periphery. We have off-center cells that are exactly the opposite. Again, if it's total blackness, no effect, right? There's no stimulus, everything's basically normal. If we have black in the center, high rate of fire, um, if we start to have light in the center and black around, we're inhibiting everything. Right? If we have both, then we're kind of at a neutral state here. So for this particular area, this likes to have darkness in the center of the visual field. Light around it actually makes it even better, right? Because we're exciting, uh, they were, um, sorry, Claire, give me a hint some time. That's the opposite of having a lot of dark there, okay? So that is what we call surround inhibition. Now, it gets a little more complicated when we have to start comparing colors. So information from cones that is traveling through this P-type or midget ray retinal ganglion cell, midget on retinal, uh, bipolar cells and midget uh, off bipolar cells, <coughs> that information is gonna be a little more complex, right? We have some stuff where we're actually not doing any comparison at all Right, where we're just passing on information about red, green, <coughs> or blue. But we do have retinal ganglion cells that are starting to compare colors within the retina. And so some of this is pretty explanatory, right? So for example, um, we have cells that like red in the center, but if you start adding in green information around it, they will stop firing or informations that like green in the center, but red on the outside will stop it from firing, right? So we're starting to compare red and green. Um, that's kind of interesting because we said red and green are very closely related to each other as far as evolutionary history. Um, it turns out that we also compare red-green information to blue. Blue is a separate thing that's existed for a long time. The red and green being two different things is fairly new, so we just compare red and green to blue. If we think about red, putting red and green together, it makes yellow, okay? And so the other thing we can do is we can compare yellow to blue surround, or blue to yellow surround. Right? So again, we've kind of literally, if we were to sort of go through all this, we'd probably sit down and kind of talk about 10 or 12 different types of retinal ganglion cells just based on those spots, right? Um, and so the key takeaway, takeaway messages here that I want you to remember, and I'll go back just to make sure I hit them all, right, is that we want to remember going forward, right, that we do have some stuff that looks for really large events. Those are the diffuse system. But again, we keep track of both on and off information. And again, this is the type that has a lot of the really nice surround stuff. We also have stuff that keeps track of very small local events like activating small numbers of cones or even single cones in some cases. But we also have diffuse information about color that again is about comparing large areas of color, right? So those surround things that we talk about depend on kind of larger receptive fields like this. Now ultimately, as we said, all this information is gonna go back to mostly the thalamus we're heading next. And we're gonna see that by the time we get to the thalamus, we have already started to sort of segregate different types of information. So we have information about basically movement. There's a lot of rod information going to certain areas of the, cord of the, the thalamus. We have information about various colors, right? So red and green information, and also blue information that again is also going back to the thalamus in separate streams. So not only do we sort of have different retinal ganglion cells collecting different parts of information, different types of information, they're actually traveling back in little streams that are kind of collected together. So if we were to look at this uh, thing with the optic nerve and the optic tract, well, there's information segregated in there that we've already started to process in the retina and we're keeping it together as they go back to the thalamus. And then of course, 
ultimately most of that is going to go back to the visual cortex, which we call E1, and we'll talk about how the processing is going forward from there. So those are the major areas we're going to be talking about. There are a few other areas we're going to simulate information that are still important. I just want to touch on these a little bit for a second. We send axons from the retina to the hypothalamus. And so I mentioned the cells that are expressing melanopsin. Those cells are getting information about whether it's day or night, so they're looking at just past and new light levels. That information is going back to what we call the pre, um, the pre uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus. which is sitting right above the uh, cross of the optic nerve. And it's often just called the SCN, um, which is sitting right approximately there, right above the other side of that cross there. Um, if you mention this to Dr. Campbell, she'll flip out because she loves this area. Um, this is really important for setting our circadian rhythm, so our day and night cycle. So that information is feeding into the hypothalamus. The pretectum. <laughs> this area is really responsible for our pupil responses. And so, you know, if we have light or dark on our pupils, our, light, our eyes will constrict or dilate. And as you're probably aware, that doesn't, you know, that's not a rule about the sign control. So this is kind of information broadly about light levels as well. Um, that information is going to um, really be ipsilateral and contralateral. So, for example, there is a reflex that we can do that if you shine a light in someone's eye, um, that will cause a burst of constriction of that pupil. The other pupil should constrict, even though it's not seeing the light. And if one pupil dilates, the other should dilate. Um, you may see movies where they test those reflexes, and what they're looking for is one eye doing something and the other hand not. If that happens, you um, that means there's a, a break somewhere in the brainstem. And then we also have the superior, uh, superior colliculus. Which is really important for um, really um, orientating your eyes to movement. So again, um, if you're doing something and you see something out of, from the corner of your eye that draws your attention, you will move your head and eye over there almost automatically, right? Or if you're watching a ball, right, you're gonna be moving with your eyes watching that. That all really is coordinated at the follicular level, right? That that kind of move, that kind of thing. It's almost subconscious that you're tracking this. Um, and so you're coordinating eye and head movements. Another common thing that happens is that you know if you have somebody and they can actually be even in a coma, you can take their head and move their head, and their eyes will stay locked in place. It's called dull's eye movement, right? Because their their head is moving, but their eyes kind of stay place because they're moving their eyes in response to it. If you ever had those old dolls that have like a glass eye in it, if you move the head, the eye stays in place. That's the kind of movement we're talking about. It's a very, very primitive reflex. Um, really the only people that don't have it are people that are um, totally brain dead, right? Even people in homeless develop that. It's because of information going to the superior cortex. Okay. Uh, so that's all really basic stuff um, as far as these kind of things are really, really basic of controlling eye movements or head movements or pupil dilation. If we want to do anything more complicated, then we're going to start having to process the visual information in D1, and we'll see there's um, some stuff we can record from there. So again, for Wednesday, we won't be having class. So I'm just going to be posting the, the test probably sometime around class time, and you guys will be handing it in on the next Wednesday. Okay? And again, it covers really, um, I think everything from the synapse all the way out to somatosynthesis. I can't remember exactly where we started, but synapse, I think, is where we started. So some of the machinery all the way to the synapse.